Let's welcome in our co-hosts on this Thursday morning. He is the New York Times best-selling author, the social assassin, John Gilstrap. Good morning, John. Good morning. And you know what? After people go to the first day of the home show on April yeah. 6th, they should wander down at 2 o'clock to the... Uh, library in Martinsburg to attend the the um, book session that's being put on by uh, Martinsburg Public Library. What is it? Uh, Martinsburg Berkeley County Public Library. Be myself and another author. I wish you knew you were, I knew you were going to mention that because I can't pull up her name. She's very very successful, far more successful than I. Armin uh, Trout. Armin Trout. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, romance author. It's wow. first time I've been doing. Her. I know. I know. <laughs> What's he going to do? What's he going to do? Yeah, did you want to clarify anything in the article? No. No? Okay. <laughs> You're just mean. <laughs> I, I mean, I, can, I will give a process update, certainly, if, if you want to hear about... Yeah, what, what 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 you know the steps going what, forward? What, what steps were yesterday and what steps next? So, do it, if you can do it in sixty seconds. Sure, evidence was received by the three ju judge panel. Yeah. Now, what they're requiring us to do is submit conclusions of law, and, or excuse me, um, our our proposed orders, um, and they, those are due by um, the nineteenth of April, mm -hmm. and then we have till the twenty third to respond to the other sides. And then the judges will take those and, and, and plus their own considerations and make a ruling. So, you know, they're really going to take a deep dive into the into the law and apply the facts to the laws that govern all these different issues. And there's there's a lot. There's a lot. Mm -hmm. And they'll be the ultimate decision maker. And, and then this, then they'll have an uh, uh, oper then either side will have an opportunity to appeal to the Supreme Court. And this is over the potential removal of Commissioners Jackson and Kraus in Jefferson County and that whole ordeal. 810, and we turn our attention to our first guest of the morning, Teresa Torseva. She is a candidate for attorney general in West Virginia in the Democratic Party and does have an opponent, too, as well. Teresa, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Good morning. It's, it's great to be uh, from one panhandle to another this morning in West Virginia. Yeah, which part of the northern panhandle are you in this morning? So I'm in Wheeling, which is my home. And so Ohio County, mm -hmm. I-70 runs right through here. And uh, I was just there in uh, Martinsburg, in your area, uh, earlier this week. And I'll be there again tomorrow. Oh. So it's a familiar out. Yeah. Very good. What will you be doing in Martinsburg tomorrow? Well, there is a, there is a dinner tomorrow night to honor a local legend, uh, the Virginia Sign Dinner. And I'll be attending that. So I'm excited. Yeah, Virginia is a local legend, by the way. Yeah. And, I know. I, I don't say that tongue in cheek. She's amazing. Oh yeah, and uh, <laughs> I, I I'm trying to remember how long it's been. 2016, 2017, I think it was, at the uh, the Italian community of, of which I am a member uh, does a uh, dinner. Used to before COVID anyway at the Dandamucci Lodge, which is lo actually located in Hagerstown across the bridge in Maryland, and I was uh, asked to be the keynote speaker at that. Uh, event and, and I believe Virginia was one of the folks behind that invitation. So uh, when you see her, please give her a hug for me. I'll do just that. That puts a smile on my face. I know it will her. She's always building other people up. So an amazing, an amazing woman. So I'm excited to visit again. And thank you for having me on this morning to talk about my campaign for Attorney General. Teresa, tell us about your background and what got you to the point of becoming a candidate for AG. So I've always been an attorney as long as I've been an adult, basically. I came through uh, public schools in West Virginia College and then law school at, from WVU in 1995. Uh, and I have 30 years of courtroom experience. So there, there are a few main things that I think distinguish me as a candidate for attorney general. So 30 years of courtroom experience is, I think, critical because how can you run the office that's basically one of the largest, if not the largest, law firms in the state for the state and for the people, right? If you have lawyers that go into the courtroom or need to and you've never sort of been there or you don't know how that works, it's critical. So much happens in the courts and for people. The second thing I think that really distinguishes me is, is that I am from the northern panhandle, and, um, and and I know folks in the eastern panhandle. By the way, my sister lives in the eastern panhandle there in our Harpers Ferry I understand sort of that, um, you know, there's a lot that's going on the further you get away from uh, the center seat of government there in Charleston. And I think it's important to have the perspective of statewide elected officials from the panhandles. And, uh, you know, I would be, um, uh, a lot of people are shocked to hear this, but 
there has never, ever in the history of the state of West Virginia ever been a female attorney general. And it's time, and I'm qualified. And the reason I, I will ask people to say, so everyone can say, well, here's what I'm going to do when I get elected. Here's how great I am. <laughs> it's a little, honestly, even for a courtroom lawyer like me, a little uncomfortable. But I would just encourage people to check out my client base. It's predominantly West Virginia's first responders, firefighters, police officers, 911 operators, deputy sheriffs. They're in the Eastern Panhandle, for example. I work with the Berkeley County School Nurses and the Jefferson County Deputy Sheriffs. So that's really what I stand for, protecting families and working people and West Virginians. And I think the Attorney General's office is really an area where more of that, I, I, more of that needs to happen. In other words, the, the office needs to be a better advocate for people. All right, John Gilstrap. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm always I'm sort of confounded about why a position like attorney general would be a partisan position, but the way it's built, it is. And we, uh, Patrick Morrissey has gotten a lot of press and is very proud of his record as being very pro Second Amendment, and very pro all the, the sort of quintessential Republican uh, priorities. And the Democrat, the certainly the, the, the stereotype Democrat is anti Second Amendment, anti fossil fuels, anti a lot of the things that are are quintessentially West Virginian. So where do you stand? You're, you're running as a Democrat. So where do you stand on those issues? Certainly. And um, you named a couple that I'm happy to respond to, but I, I'm also love to talk about any of the issues. Let's start with with um, one that I think is important and always generates a lot of discussion, even though I think it's relatively secure, at least for now. We thought women thought their rights were secure, too, until we lost Roe versus Wade. I am pro-gun for the same reason I'm pro-choice. I, I do not believe that it is for the government to decide those rights. Those rights belong to individual people, and the government has 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 taken away, for example, for women the right. As to guns, it's the same as free speech. It's the same as freedom to my property. And all of the, all of the rights that we have embodied in the Constitution uh, have reasonable limitations because we live in a society together. I can't yell fire in a crowded theater. That's a basic one that everybody really does understand why, right? But I have a free speech right. You do. But it, 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 has, it has some reasonable limits. Um, and so what we're seeing, for example, on the pro-choice issue is we're seeing uh, women's rights uh, just being obliterated. And it's the same fear people have regarding guns. It's a rights issue. I am really – I wrote down and, when, and chuckled a little to myself when you were asking the question. You mentioned a stereotypical Democrat. It really matters sort of where you are too in the country is it a national uh, issue that you're talking about a local issue i am born and raised in west virginia in a coal mining county on a farm uh, so i know what we are and who we are and uh, what i also know is that 24 percent of the electorate in west virginia are independent voters in other words they've rejected partisanship and what they want are their rights protected too they want the government to work for them which is what i would do as an attorney general work Work every single day in the courtrooms and investigating outside of the courtrooms, right, for the people, then they want government to get out of the way and not interfere. Uh, so that's a little bit of an overview. Um, I hope I addressed your qu the question. I'm happy to answer sort of any other issues, but I don't want to. <laughs> So I'm a courtroom lawyer. I mentioned I, I could go on, um, and I'm certain you have other guests lined up. Well, I did, I'm a refugee from the Commonwealth of Virginia. I've only been in West Virginia for a couple of years now, and, and I have watched the effect that the, the change in partisanship in the uh, AG's office can have. And in the case of Virginia, a lot of it has to do with the choices that are made by the AG and what not to challenge. And it is certainly reflected in, it has been reflected in a great diminishment, if that's a word, of, of gun rights in, uh, in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And those, those are the kinds of concerns that, that I think people have. And uh, so why should, if the Attorney General is the lawyer for the, for the state of West Virginia. So 
Yeah. Should that even be a partisan position? So there are a number of things that I think attorney generals, and I think it, it, certainly we can look to West Virginia, um, use the office, make issues partisan in order to, uh, w- w- as we like to say, throw red meat to someone, right? Um, some base, right? All across the spectrum, we see this in partisan politics. The problem is, um, I believe that an attorney general's position really isn't partisan. There should be independent. For example, the attorney general has incredible power, incredible power. And the power just to investigate is an incredible power, right, of the government. And so that should be used very judiciously, very carefully, very sparingly. And I don't think people want it used in a way that's, that's partisan, they want it used in a way that's, that's for the good, right? The government works better, uh, the government follows the law, that businesses follow the law, that, that households and families that, that have, that are the backbone of the economy, right? The consumers are protected. Uh, so it's an interesting question that you posed, and, and I am familiar um, with what you're talking about a little bit in Virginia. I, I, um, I laughed too at your comment, a refugee from the Commonwealth. I'm welcome to West Virginia, by the way. Uh, but yes, I, I do think that partisanship has infected the attorney general's offices statewide, and you also see um, that you see it being used as a sword. You see things not being pursued, as you indicated, because of politics. And the less of that you have, the better it is going to be for people. And so I think what you have to do as attorney general, what I would do once I'm elected as West Virginia's first female attorney general, is become an attorney general for all the people and all the interests, small businesses, big businesses, people, families, households, West Virginians. And um, the problem that I see is, is a little less about partisanship, and maybe it mixes in, but is, is that we protect sort of out-of-state business interests first, and then we ignore the in-state business interest all the way down to the household and the individual consumers. Matt Harvey, attorney to attorney. <laughs> Good morning, Teresa. How are you? It's so nice to hear you. I, I put a big smile on my face when I was uh, on hold listening and you were on. Very nice to hear from you. <laughs> it's been a while. Um, what would be your priorities, your top priorities, if you were successful in November? I would have... A- Two main, or three, I guess you could say, main priorities. The first would be, uh, you certainly could say that I would be and tend to be a consumer protection czar. I believe in deterrence, and I think if there's an active consumer protection division of the attorney general's office, that a lot of illegal activity that harms households and families just wouldn't happen, and there would be help um, for consumers. So that would be a, an important push of mine. Another push of mine would be um, I'm a big fan of exposing bad conduct because it's the best way for it to be fixed because voters just won't tolerate things once they know it, but they need to know. Um, and so I think there has to be accountability in government. I would use the office to conduct investigations, uh, which is exactly, you know, as the AG is is designed to do, Um, even in cases where the AG isn't empowered to bring lawsuits, the AG is empowered to investigate because we all know that every, you know, all bad things die in the sunlight, right, in terms of uh, corruption and other things that occur in government. And I would also be active issuing advisory opinions um, that clarify areas of the law that would help uh, parties and litigants, especially public employees and um, municipalities, county commissions, others, uh, clarify things that are unclear related to uh, public employees and their wages and pensions and things. We see a lot of that, um, and that would be something that I think the Attorney General could focus on. Um, the advisory opinions are, are, Matt, as you know, just persuasive, as not authoritative, uh, but I found them uh, to have a great influence in, um, in the courts. Sure do. So those would be three main focuses. Um, I have a lot of other ideas, including um, you, no one in the panhandle there will be surprised to hear me say satellite offices. I don't think you can serve the people of West Virginia the way I envision without satellite offices that really reach into the communities and the panhandles and in the southern coal fields and over over in both western and eastern Virginia on the borders and things like that. So that's also um, one of the things that I want to implement. 
Well, one issue that I have to ask you about as a prosecutor is would you be in favor or do you think that the the AG needs expanded prosecutorial powers? You know, in, in I, criminal cases, to, to be clear to the listeners. I, I, you know, that's the first that I've encountered that question. I, I can tell you that I think the prosecuting attorneys in West Virginia do wonderful work. And um, I, I don't know that any of the powers of the attorney general currently need expanded. I think they, the powers of the attorney general need uh, utilized, executed. In other words, um, I think the attorney general's office needs to be very, very active and do do its thing. Um, but but my initial reaction, Matt, how about if we put a pen in that? And, and I said, that's a great, first of all, I love lawyers because we always ask those probing questions. And that is a really important question. My initial reaction is the attorney general has enough power uh, that, that can be used to do so much good and that just needs to be done. I think the prosecuting attorneys serve the role of prosecuting criminal cases quite well in each county. And I, and I brought it up because there's recently been legislation proposed that would have that effect. Yeah, so so I, 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 I that's power-seeking is what, it, again, I'm giving my initial reaction, Matt, a great yes. question, but um, I don't like the idea. My criticism of the office has been um, for the last several terms that I feel like it is the laws on the books are not being enforced. Um, the laws on the books are not being used to help people. So I'm not really even looking for legislative or other changes. I just want the office to function as it's envisioned already on the books. So very interesting. Um, so expanding the attorney general for prosecutorial purposes seems like overlap um, where that's already covered. And, you know, that's also – I mean, completely separate from the policy question, it's it's government waste, right? So, what? Yes, General, I agree. <laughs> so many lawyers already, and not enough to help and serve the people in these other civil areas that prosecutors can't handle or, or aren't authorized, right? So, it it would be wasteful, it seems. So, I have to check that legislation out, Matt. Did it die um, in the uh, session? It's not gotten anywhere now. Yeah, because I, I, I didn't hear much about it after it was initially passed so or Proposed. introduced. Uh, Teresa yeah, torres Seva is our guest here, by the way. She is a candidate for attorney general, Democrat, uh, does have an opponent in the primary. Teresa, in regards to the work the attorney general's office does with its own staff versus that which is farmed out to those who might have more expertise, what would your procedure be like for that? Oh, that's a great question. So, and, and I'll, let me just start out with my own bias on this. I'm completely biased because I myself served nine times as a special assistant attorney general serving the people of West Virginia over the course of my career. And those were on cases that I specifically handle, had expertise on um, to the extent that uh, but I want to make clear to lawyers are not experts or allowed to call themselves experts on anything. Um, expertise comes awful close. But, but all kidding aside, um, those cases um, were brought would, – would, would have been very difficult, if not impossible, for the attorney general's office to bring them. But more importantly, it allows the attorney – I would very, very clearly and loudly, let me say, use – every resource available to the state of West Virginia and to the attorney general's office to help and represent people and enforce the law. And outside counsel is a big area that does help do that. I was involved, for example, in one of those nine cases where we as a team of four law firms that were specially appointed by the attorney general returned uh, $15.9 million to the general revenue fund. So that, that helps all taxpayers, right, because that's like tax revenue. And from, from a lawsuit that was able to be successful in West Virginia because there was a law that only the attorney general could enforce and a damages provision that applied only if it was the attorney general bringing the case. So it was um, an, an excellent example of why it basically wouldn't have happened, right, and the consumers would have been out for harm that was already proven nationally and for which vendors nationally uh, got, you know, billions of dollars in settlements. So that's, 
it, it's just it's an absolute no brainer. And I think that everybody that's being objective and not political or not sort of attacking for 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 the wrong reasons has to admit that it's a. It doesn't matter who the attorney general is, Democrat, Republican, or otherwise, the attorney general should be using counsel um, outside of their own office and with fee arrangements that are beneficial to the state, um, like a contingent fee arrangement, for example, where the lawyers only get paid if they win. That's a huge benefit to clients, and the state, and it can be a huge benefit to, to the state. So I think it's an important resource the state should absolutely utilize. We have some of the best lawyers in the country practicing in the courts of West Virginia. I've seen them, and I go, uh, uh, most of them uh, uh, feels like are in my chases sometimes on the other side, so it's good. Matt Harvey, one more question. Oh, um <laughs> No, I did didn't. you forget your question? No, I didn't. You, you, I gave you. I don't have a question. Oh, I thought you put up your hand like no. you had a question. Okay, never no, mind. I'm then. Sorry, I thought we were getting too close on time. Teresa, we're just about <laughs> out of time. Uh, yeah. Please take this moment to address our audience and let them know why they should vote for you for attorney general in the upcoming primary. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate being on with you. It's been a great morning, and I've uh, I've learned a lot. I appreciate it a lot. Uh, if you check out my website, TeresaForAttorneyGeneral.com, you'll be able to find out more about me. You can also Google my name, which is pretty unique, Teresa Torreseva, and check out our cases. I really do stand on the work that our law firm, Torreseva Law in Wheeling, here in the other panhandle uh, does and, and the work we do. We're proud of representing working people fighting for their wages uh, and their and their rights, their independent rights. Remember, it's time for the first female attorney general of West Virginia. Uh, let's let's break that down and move on from that. And uh, really, really fun being on with you all this morning. Great. Uh, I uh, used to be on talk radio, Rob, and I miss it and enjoy it. You're doing a great job with your show. Teresa, thank you. Anytime you're in the panhandle, you want to combine co-host, I'll put you right beside Mr. Harvey. <laughs> as long as you don't bring Josh with you. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, there's only there are only so many microphones, so I'm gonna uh, Josh will have to Josh will have to wait. Yeah, and he just <laughs> gave you mine. <laughs> oh no, there's, like, there's two empty chairs oh, okay. right there, John. Right. Teresa, thank you very Good much. Good luck to you. Have a great day. Thanks, you Teresa Torres, a candidate for attorney general in a uh, statewide office where there is an actual Democratic primary. Good, because there's two folks going in yep. the Democratic uh, primary for attorney general there. So who knows, maybe that's the first signs of a little rebirth of the Democratic Party in the state.